Yeah, hello, neat aspirants. How are you all? Hope you are doing good. Yes. So today we are going to start with a lecture that is origin and evolution, a very important chapter. Last year in two thousand twenty-one, there were three questions from this chapter. So it is an important chapter. It may have around three or four questions. So that makes a difference here. Okay. So let's start our chapter that is origin and evolution. So now the question comes to you. what is evolution evolution is something to you know unmask those hidden you know mystery which are there on earth so it is to unfold or unroll or to reveal something which is hidden okay so those hidden potentialities when they are revealed for example some fossils when we unearth so that is something what we are studying is evolution what has happened on this earth or maybe on universe it is an orderly change from one condition to another usually it is an orderly change but sometimes it may be due to some sudden catastrophic events also okay so let's start uh, our journey and now the question comes to you what is evolutionary biology is it different from the evolution yes when you study something you know uh, life forms on earth when you study the evolutionary history of the life forms on earth that is actually called as evolutionary biology now what happens what do you study in that do you study plants or only animals so it is the changes in flora and fauna that means you are going to study the evolution of plants also and the animals also the evolutionary history of plants and the animals which has happened over millions of years not a uh, one year or two years it has happened over millions of years that is what we study in the evolutionary biology so it is written in ncert so be very specific now so when you study about evolution you don't consider evolution only on earth you have to study little bit what has happened in the background in the universe so how is that universe evolved So if you see universe what is actually universe universe is a huge cluster of galaxies it's not one or two galaxy it is billions and billions of galaxies and that galaxies have been formed these galaxies have formed and they contain now stars of clouds gases and dust you can see how these galaxies look like it is our milky way galaxy in that our earth is just small speck here okay you can see this is a milky way galaxy somewhere our earth will be here or somewhere okay so this is how huge this galaxy is there in the galaxy our solar system is there and we are somewhere a dot here only okay so now you see big bang theory now what is big bang theory this theory was proposed by lemaitre and this is around you know this is a hypothesis to explain you how this universe evolved what has happened on this you know how this life or the planets would have evolved so this is something which was uh, explained by big bang theory lemaitre was the one who gave this hypothesis and he told that universe originated about 20 billion years ago it is 20 billion years ago the universe would have you know started the formation and how this formation would have started it is because of the huge explosion it is a thermonuclear explosion which has happened and you can't imagine also in terms of physical limits that kind of explosion would have taken place and because of that you know the explosion the gases the hydrogen and helium would have cooled down afterwards and form some clouds gases and then galaxies would have come up okay now you see earth has formed around 4.5 billion years ago and there was no atmosphere on early earth so no atmosphere at all on early earth was present got it let's talk about the theories now which are there to explain you the origin of life on earth so there have been some theories which are very relevant 
and which are accept most accepted but there are some which are not accepted more so we'll talk one by one each of the theory okay so let's see who proposed those theories first the first theory that was theory of a special creation was proposed by so these were proposed by we'll just write proposed by here and this was proposed by father suarez okay so this was more of a you know religious theory as compared to evolution theory and still there are so many you know controversies here next comes the cosmic theory or the panspermia theory now this theory says that you know the life came from outer space in the form of spores so this was proposed by you know he, this was arrhenius and richer they were the ones who proposed this theory okay so we'll talk all of them all of these theories in detail spontaneous generation theory which was proposed by aristotle von helmont these were the one who were supporting this von helmont also was the one who supported this okay now biogenesis theory this was actually a a biogenesis theory this is a biogenesis theory which says the evolution has taken from place from the inorganic materials and whereas you can see biogenesis theory in biogenesis theory which was given by louis pasteur okay the most strongest proponent was louis pasteur even spallanzani and reddy were also there who were in support of this and they did some experiments also on this they say that life evolved from the pre-existing life and the most accepted theory of chemical evolution that was given by oparin and haldane so they were the one who have given the theory that life has evolved on this earth from some chemicals we'll talk about in detail how this experimental proof also is available for this theory so let us talk one by one each and every theory now so first theory we talk about is theory of a special creation now theory of a special creation says that earth is only 4000 years old and whatever species you find here they have been formed as such and there is no change in them so let's see the earth is about 4000 years old this is the one uh, you know uh, proponent one proposition all living organism that we see today were created as such there is no change in that which is really not possible anyway and diversity was always the same it has not changed so it was always same and will remain same in the future this will remain same will be the same in future also so this were the three propositions given by the special creation theory proponent okay next comes the cosmic panspermia theory now cosmic panspermia theory says that life has come from the primitive space somewhere from other planets life has come on this earth in the form of spores so maybe they may be right also because some scientists from mit and from ccmb hyderabad that is center for cellular and molecular biology institute in hyderabad they have carried those experiments and they have found some bacteria existing in upper stratosphere which are only and only dependent on hydrogen so if it is there that means definitely it is possible that life would have come from the outer space also may be possible and this is a favorite idea for some astronomers also okay so maybe they may be correct in some aspect but still we don't have any experimental proofs available as such which are more going going you know in support of chemical evolution anyway so let's keep uh, exploring further even the early greek thinkers also thought about these let's talk about the theory of a spontaneous generation now theory of a spontaneous generation it is a a biogenesis theory autogenesis means life came suddenly from the inorganic materials so this was proposed by the early you know scientists like aristotle von almond all these one were proposed these things even the ancient greek philosophers like aristotle and all they were in support of that now what this is 
that life came from non living matter this is non living matter which is giving rise to what living organisms by their own for example they thought that you know the fishes the frogs or the salamanders they are coming from the nile river okay as such from the mud of the nile river which is there the as such the you know salamanders frogs are erupting from that which may not be understood by them that they are coming from those eggs which have been laid there okay anyway even they thought that you know if you keep a moist shirt and near a jar of you know rice so what happens after some days after some weeks what happens is mites will erupt from it so they may not understand that you know maybe the breeding has uh, gone there and the new ones are coming out so maybe they have not thought that but anyway they thought that it comes from non living matter something comes automatically okay so which is a biogenesis which was disproved by louis pasteur by his experiment which is called as swan neck experiment in which he conducted some experiments what what he did he you know boiled the yeast solution i put a yeast here and uh, boiled for a long time so that you know continuous heating you know kills those microorganisms and he took a he took a special jar you know having this shape in which the mouth was very very small here narrow and this was wider in this area okay so what happened here afterwards he saw in which one the the swan neck flask which was present in that bacteria were not able to reach the killed yeast and because of that this was not contaminated but when the same jar he broke it at this place so it was from air the spores were able to come or the bacteria used to can easily come and you know feed on those killed yeast so this was something what he observed was that somewhere the you know the contamination was happening from the life which is present in the air itself so that says the life evolved from what the life is evolving from the pre existing life life is always coming from what pre existing life that was what he proposed okay so he was louis pasteur who was the one who proposed this theory even spallanzani and ready also conducted some experiments but the best one to support this was from louis pasteur anyway let's talk about and already it's given here so i'll just rub this okay yeah so you understood who gave this concept louis pasteur now comes the oparin haldin theory which is the theory of chemical evolution so it says that chemical evolution has occurred here so they were the one who gave the theory but it was experimentally proved by the miller and ure experiment so let's see what oparin and halde proposed they proposed that inorganic constituents were the one through which the organic molecules diverse organic molecules came and these diverse organic molecules like rna proteins etc would have polymerized and would have given those you know rise to the first life so first was the formation of organic molecules and then those organic molecules would have collaborated and formed the first kind of life on earth understood now let's continue now first life originated in the sea water so water is always and always essential for the origin of life this is to be noted down okay so let's continue further now now the oparin and haldane when they gave this proposition so it was experimentally proved by ure and miller ure and miller's experiment was a one which proved this proposition by oparin and haldane how so let's see in this case what is happening you see they took water boiling water here that means a source of water vapor so this is water vapor here okay so this is a source of water vapor here boiling water now this water vapor you can see is going here and this has been the whatever was present in this apparatus has been taken out by a vacuum pump and what gases were taken was ammonia methane 
water vapor and hydrogen so they were warm gases you can say warm gases were taken that is water vapor hydrogen ammonia and methane in which hydrogen ammonia and methane were in ratio of 2 is to 1 is to 2 we'll talk about this also don't worry now you see what they did this was called as a simulation experiment so what do you mean by a simulation experiment because they were trying to simulate the conditions which were present on the primitive earth so primitive earth would have definitely those you know lightning and the volcanoes were erupting lightning was going on so they took a very high temperature here around 800 degrees celsius so 800 degrees celsius temperature was maintained in this and there was light the lightning effect was being given by the spark that's electrodes were there which are producing the current there and that was high voltage was given in this apparatus okay this box this area and now what happened these gases which were taken they condensed they combined together because of these conditions and they formed some amino acids so this water now containing some organic compounds like amino acids were formed and if the question comes which amino acids were formed then you have to write it was glycine glycine alanine and aspartic acid have you got it now so these three amino acids were formed in the experiment conducted by urey and miller please note it down so amino acids which were formed were the glycine alanine and aspartic acid further when hydrogen cyanide was taken so they found some purines also were formed so that was something you know very strong uh, evidence to prove how the life would have formed and that was really this is the most accepted theory because of this reason because you have experimental proof for that and in science you have experimental proof it is considered to be the supporting evidence now we'll be talking about the evidence for organic evolution so now to till now you understood how the chemical evolution took place but now how those you know molecules how those life forms would have evolved that also evidence we need to have and for that there are some proposition the points we can discuss here one is a paleontological evidence which is for the fossils if you study fossils you can understand how the life would have evolved how, which were the forms which are present earlier and how, what kind of modification has happened in them okay now you see comparative anatomy and morphology now if you compare those limbs of cheetah humans okay and the bat you'll find that they have all those all all of them have those 30 bones in the four limbs and they are perfect example of comparative anatomy and morphology which proves homologous organs are there in them and they prove their homology also so one by one we'll talk about all in detail don't worry so let's continue vestigial organs connecting links biochemical evidence embryological evidence and biogeographical distribution of organisms we'll continue discussing one by one each so let's start with the paleontological evidence paleontological evidence talks about the fossils now tell me the newer fossils will be found in the upper strata or in the lower strata so definitely the deeper strata or the lower strata will have the older fossils because sediments would have collected you know throughout the time in millions of years the sediments would have con collected and these newer fossils will be found in the upper strata so newer fossils will be more of complex and here you can see a little bit simpler forms you'll find here simple to complex things have formed simplicity towards complexity has occurred okay so one by one we'll discuss all these things so geological history correlates with biological history that point is also very important one question has been asked in neat exam so geological history correlates with biological history that means whatever kind of you know minerals deposits and all you are finding in this region you will understand what kind of living forms were there so geological history will correlate with what biological history of an organism got it very important question let's talk about the types of fossils now 
Now this fossil, as you can see here, is of mammoth. And mammoth fossil has been preserved as such. You can see even the you know, blood also you can see. And even the flesh is so you know, fresh that it can be fed to dogs. Because in that kind of you know, temperature, very low temperature, even the microorganisms are unable to you know, work. So that is why the flesh has been preserved in a very nice manner. So almost complete organism has got buried in that, in the Siberian region. So this is a kind of what? This is a kind of unaltered fossil. Please write down, unaltered fossil. Fossils can be many types. So let's talk about some different type of fossil. Now you see, this is the fossilized insect trapped in an amber. Okay, this is the insect which has been trapped in an amber. When it was sitting on a tree, the amber would have just you know, covered it. And in amber, if anything gets stuck in that amber, it can be stored for, they will remain as such for millions and millions of years. There will be no change in them because even the microorganisms can't enter in that area. Next comes the petrified fossils. Petrified fossils are rock-like fossils. When the mineral deposition also happens in the body, so what happens, the organism is becomes very hard, like rock. So they are called as petrified fossils. That means fossils like rocks. Next, you can see the print fossils. In the print fossils, you have the outer boundary only of the organism. Okay, somewhere you can see the outer boundary of the insect only is possible. You can understand that the dragonfly. Okay, so outer boundary you can see only that is the print fossils. And here you see in some soft, you know, mud and some, some, you know, mollusk has got buried inside and the fossil has been formed. So hard structures of the fossil, you can see they are making what? Cast. And you can see the mold is also present. So cast and mold can be seen in some fossils which are trapped in some muddy area or somewhere, you know, which was very soft at the time. But after that, when the must this... Uh, you know, organisms have got preserved, they have become hard, and you can find out the cast and the mold of them. Okay, so let's continue further. Now you see, comparative anatomy and morphological evidence we'll talk about. Now what are comparative anatomical and morphological evidence? As I told you, homology is a very important structure which proves what? The common origin. The similar origin, the common origin will be, you know, proved by the homologous structures. So what are homologous structures? They have the same structures which perform, they have the same origin which perform different or same function. Their structures are same, but they have similar origin. So origin similar, but they can perform different or the same functions. So you can see homology, same origin. The structures having same origin. So structures having same origin for it and they may perform same functions also or may perform different functions also for example i told you cheetah's limb okay human head human uh, limb human limb cheetah's limb all these four limbs even whale's four limb bad four limb all are homologous so let's talk about this you see here ncrt you know diagram is there Man four limb, cheetah four limb, whale four limb, and bat four limb. They have shown all of them have the thirty bones. Whatever bones you have in the four limb, radius, ulna, you know, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges, all all of the bones are similar. They also have thirty bones in their four limbs. So that perfectly proves their similar origin somewhere. Okay. Next comes the you know thorn of bougainvillea and the tendril of Cucurbita. So you can see here, thorn of Bougainvillea and tendril of Cucurbita. They also show similar origin, but they have different functions. Thorn has some different function. This tendril has some different function. But still, they show the similar origin. Function may be different. Here also you see function is different. Bat is, bat wing is used for what? Flying. Whale's forelimb is used for what? It is used for swimming. But man's hand is used for some holding some objects. 
and cheetah's four limbs are used for what running so they have different functions but origin is same same origin different function homology got it now so let's talk about the divergent evolution now homologous organs are because of divergent evolution for example cheetah was in a habitat in which he ha they have to run very fast okay the whale would have gone into the water as a secondary adaptation and then they need to swim so their functions were different but the origin was same so conditions were different because of the the reason the structures got modified into some some different you know forms but origin is again same so let's see how when the same structures develop along different directions due to adaptation to different needs this is called divergent evolution so what is happening here you can see same structures are developing along different directions due to adaptation to different needs and this is called as divergent evolution okay so the homology indicates what common ancestry it is based on divergent evolution so homology will be based on divergent evolution now let's see adaptive radiation now students do come and ask always sir what is divergent evolution how is it different from adaptive radiation so it is very very simple to understand now some people who were living in some uh, one state of india for example they were living in madhya pradesh and now some of the reason they you know diverged they went to some went to rajasthan some went to uh, this uh, bengal some went to you know karnataka or kerala and some went to the jammu and kashmir so what happened they have now gone into different different areas so when they have gone into different areas so their languages will be different their food habits will, will be different so they have to adapt to that correct so one thing was starting was divergent evolution divergent means they have went outside but now they have gone there they have to adapt to it so the adaptation which will take place in the long course of time will give rise to adaptive radiation and this can be easily proved by darwin's finches darwin finches what happened the some birds went to galapagos island so when they landed there so they they were seed eating birds originally they were seed eating birds now when they reached there they had some different habitats now some had only you know uh, insects to eat some islands had only cactus some island had more of you know kind of um, cactus uh, was there in some different different type of uh, island some different food was there so accordingly they have to adapt to it to survive on that island so that slowly and slowly a uh, soap process would have gone and adaptive radiation would have taken place there got it now so let us continue and let us understand now so the process of evolution of different species in a given geographical area starting from a point and literally radiating to other areas of geography is called what adaptive radiation okay examples you see darwin's finches which we talked about next is the australian marsupials and third one is your placental mammals all of them show the adaptive radiation so let us see each one example each of the following example in detail now so let's see first darwin's finches so as i told you darwin's finches the original stock was seed eating bird which was somewhere in the uh, uh, american uh, region and from there they diverged to galapagos they went to galapagos island so here you see so the original ones were seed eaters so these seed eaters are already there you can see large finch medium finch small finch sharp beak ground finch all are what till here you can see all are what seed eaters now one has got modified into cactus eating cactus ground finch now this warblers and the tree finches these are what all are insect eaters you can see so the grasping bills probing bills these are what insect eaters but one has got modified into a parrot like bill so bill so this is a fruit eater so one is a fruit eater others you can see they are all 
insect eaters whether it is probing bills grasping bills wobbler finches tree finches most of them are what insectivorous in that area so you see how the divergent evolution has resulted into adaptive radiation now they have to adapt they have to live in that you know island they have to take the food that kind of particular food so their beak has to got modified and you can see the beaks have got modified accordingly okay you can see here beaks have got modified accordingly so one which is parrot like other is you know pointed you can see got it this was about the adaptive radiation in darwin finches now we'll talk about the australian marsupials now there was some original ancestral stock called as marsupial in australia afterwards this ancestral marsupial has given radiation has given rise to different different types of you know um and you know, this uh, members here is species here for example you see this marsupial ancestor has given rise to tiger cat that is spotted cuscus tasmanian wolf sugar glider marsupial mole keola bandicoot warm bat kangaroo marsupial rat and banded ant eater so these all have diverged from the common marsupial in the same way the placental mammals origin also took place in australia so let's see the original placental stock gave rise to flying squirrel wolf bobcat ant eater mouse deer brown bear lemur rabbit and the mole so these all have taken origin from the placental stock some placental ancestor has given rise to all these now if these you know organisms placental mammal and the you know marsupial they have some similarity in them because of living in the same environment then it is not adaptive radiation it will be convergent evolution that also we'll talk about later okay so let's see analogous structures analogy means they have different origin but same structure different origin same structure now suppose some american or some african and one australian they all come to india and settle with a individual who is living in the uh, madhya pradesh now what has happened some different type of you know some different members have come from different parts of the con uh, countries different countries uh, people have come here and settled here now in madhya pradesh so what is going to happen they have to adapt to that situations okay so the at least now they are humans but suppose there were some other animals also if they would come on this uh, the one one region and now they are living so they have to adapt to it so that means origin was different from them the origin was different but now they have come to that place so now they have to adapt to that place now so that will be considered as what analogous structure that is analogy you see how so in this case what happens origin is different but function is same for example if you all go into water okay all these you know animals if we send them water in the water we send lizard also in water we send crocodile is already in the water we send the you know cow also and dog also in water so they have to adapt now slowly and slowly i am not talking about now they will adapt in a quick uh, manner it may take some millions of years so it's not that easy also but anyway they have to adapt and swim if they want to survive so in that case what happens is analogous structures will develop so let's see how for example butterfly is a insect correct and bird is a vertebrate or a chordate now butterfly will also have wings birds will also have wings so wings have developed in both of them but they have very different origin very very different origin you see their wings are very different their wings have bones also but here you can't see butterfly wings has some bones or something they have particular bones so wing of bird and wing of butterfly will be always a analogous structure clear to you let's see now some more examples we'll talk about even very close you see penguin and dolphin they both are vertebrates 
but it's still one is mammal other is what bird penguin is bird and dolphin is what mammal both are in water still they have some different the origin is different the function is same both both have the paddles or the flippers by which they swim but still they have different origin function is same origin is different what it now here you see sweet potato and potato now sweet potato and potato both are organs of storage both are modification of stem correct sweet potato and potato this is a stem actually and this is a root sorry this is a stem this is a root so what happens they have different origin but function is same function is storage both of them are storing food but here this is a modification of a stem this is a modification of root so origin will be obviously different got it that is why it is what analogous structure so analogous structures will you know support the convergent evolution they are because of what convergent evolution what is convergent evolution now now convergent evolution means when you have the same habitat okay and in that kind of environment the two kind of different type of species also develop same type of structure that is called what convergent evolution got it now let's see how when different structures evolve for the same function due to similar habitat for example in water in water the similar habitat is there now they have to swim and that may result in what that results in convergent evolution understood now examples already i told you so analogy doesn't indicate common ancestry so it doesn't indicate common ancestry common ancestry is shown by homologous structure analogy will never indicate common ancestry so it is based on the convergent evolution so analogy will support what it is due to convergent evolution got it now let's continue further and let's see what is adaptive convergent or convergent evolution now adaptive convergence when more than one adaptive radiation now you see when more than one adaptive radiation not a single adaptive radiation more than one adaptive radiation one adaptive radiation is occurring at some place other adaptive radiation is also occurring in the common geographical region here you see in an isolated geographical region more than one adaptive radiation is occurring one adaptive radiation can be of what marsupials one adaptive radiation can be of mammals okay so this will be called convergent evolution let's see how okay let's see with the example now here you see placental mammals and here is australian marsupials so one is marsupial other is a placental mammal for example if i talk about the ant eater in case of mammal it is having convergent evolution with what numbat that is marsupial so this is marsupial and this is what placental even the tasmanian wolf will have the convergent evolution with what wolf is spotted cuscus that is tiger cat will have what convergent evolution with lemur so you can understand now what is convergent evolution and what is adaptive radiation so this individual adaptive radiation has taken place for separate this individual adaptive radiation has taken place separately but both of the adaptive radiation are in a common place now that is australia and because of that they show what convergent evolution got it now let's continue further examples you see placental mammals in australia also exhibit adaptive radiation in evolving into varieties of such placental mammals each of which appears to be similar to a corresponding marsupial for example wolf that is placental and tasmanian wolf which is what marsupial so here you can clearly see the convergent evolution between these two got it now very clear to you yes some questions may come from that so be prepared don't forget the names keep 
solving some matching questions or maybe you can hide your something and you can learn from that easily okay but do solve some questions on that anyway let's continue with some more evidences now like vestigial organs so vestigial organs also prove that somewhere that organ was working but now because of some reason it's not working now it has become what vestigial so let us see how they can prove that some evolution occurred okay let's continue so vestigial organs are those organs which are present in reduced form so now they are not working but earlier they were working so that proves somewhere that earlier that organ was present and they may have some link with other animals also so let's continue and see that nictitating membrane now this is the nictitating membrane in some animals it is present and it is very useful when they are in water like frog frog will have this advantage of nictitating membrane in the water but you can't you have to use swimming goggles for that you want to see something in water you have to you know be uh, you can't see easily so this was the advantage this is the advantage to frog but which is now vestigial in humans because it's not used okay in the same way you can see appendix wormy form appendix this is what wormy form appendix so this wormy form appendix which was earlier useful in humans because they used to eat the plant those food only they were living on trees their ancestors used to live on trees and then they used to only and only feed on what plant based foods but now because of the change in the diet okay which has happened they are now vestigial this has become vestigial wormy form appendix have become vestigial means it's not that in use for digestion purpose for the cellulose digestion which was taking place it is not being used any way now only the cecum is there little bit you can have some you know microbes useful microbes in that but it's still not the ones who digest cellulose okay so this is what vestigial organ in case of humans it has some lymphoid function that is different thing one very important you know structures which uh, can prove that how the evolution is taking place is atavism in some members in humans also in some cases what happens ancestral characters appear now ancestral character when they appear in the child in the young one so that is called as what that is called as atavism now you see presence of tail a presence of tail in newborn baby is a perfect example of atavism that means ancestral character which was present has occurred in the baby now it can be easily removed you know it can be you know surgery can be done and it can be cured but the some cases like you know full uh, body has a hairs on that that is difficult to you know uh, get rid of but this is at least one which it can be rid of also so anyway this is called atavism okay some ancestral character appearing suddenly clear sure let's continue further now let's talk about the connecting links very very important topic here now connecting links are a proof that evolution how the evolution has progressed for example humans or the mammals have evolved from what they have evolved from birds or they have evolved from ra uh, reptiles that will be only proved by what connecting links so in connecting links you can easily connect those organisms those animals are present who can just have some characters of the mammals also and characters of the reptiles also like duck billed platypus that has characters of reptiles also it has characters of mammals also so that is a perfect connecting link between what mammals and reptiles and it proves also that mammals have evolved from reptiles so let's see how let's take some examples example number 1 you see proterospongia now proterospongia is a connecting link between what protozoa and sponges connecting link between protozoa and sponges that is porifera next comes a neopilina 
so neopilina will be a connecting link between annelids and the molluscans next you see the peripetus peripetus will be a connecting link between what annelids and arthropod because they have characters of annelids also and arthropods also balanoglossus now balanoglossus is a member of hemichordata and hemichordata has some characters of chordates also and has some characters of non chordates also that is why it is a characteristic connecting between what non chordates and chordates chimera now chimera is a connecting link between the cartilaginous fish and the bony fish so you can't say it's a bony fish or cartilaginous fish because the cartilaginous fish appeared earlier than bony fishes so cartilaginous fish and then bony fishes connecting link will be what chimera got it simoria simoria is a connecting link between the you know amphibians and the reptiles okay amphibians and reptiles archaeopteryx archaeopteryx will be a connecting link between the birds okay the reptiles and the birds so reptiles first and then birds came so that is a connecting link between what reptiles and birds and platypus as i told you duck bill platypus it is a connecting link between the reptiles and mammals got it clear to you so this is very important you must be knowing it okay learn take it to twice read it twice and do it okay you will get the pdf also now biochemical evidence now we have similarity even with bacteria also we have much more similarities because some you know chemicals are still there which prove common origin okay for example you can see here some proteins and some genes which perform a given function among diverse organisms give clues to a common ancestry so some proteins and genes are always common between those you know lower strata organisms and the higher strata organisms so they are still proving that you know the common origin was somewhere somewhere they were having some common origin now composition and structure of protoplasm enzymes hormones dna blood in chordates is also almost same for example if you talk about the hemoglobin also in the blood of chimpanzee and humans almost it is similar so this shows that organism always shared ancestors in recent or distant past long back back they had some you know close ancestry or in the recent past in the recent also recently they have diverged so that may be also linked with this phenomenon so biochemical evidence is a very strong evidence to prove the common origin now comes the embryological evidence now in embryological evidence there was a scientist called ernest heckel now ernest heckel was the one who told about the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny this was the you know principle given by heckel it is called heckel's biogenetic law so according to heckel's biogenetic law he says that organism shows its ancestral all adult stages all the ancestral stages will be shown in the embryonic stage for example if you see in the different embryos like fish salamander tortoise chicken human all embryos have been shown in different stages and you can see all have gill slits all have tail okay so the heckel was saying that all ancestral characters will be compulsory shown in the embryonic stages which was disproved by von beer so von beer was the one who disproved it he told that you know the embryos never pass through the adult stages of other animals they never do this thing okay got it now even bayer's law you can see in embryonic stages general characters will appear first and specialized characters will appear 
later so general characters are going to appear the first and then you will have some specialized characters so this was a proof given in uh, embryological basis got it clear now comes the biogeographical realms now biogeography also proves that somewhere the organisms had common origin let's see how for example if you talk about the alligators alligators will be found in what they are found in north america and they are also found in the china and you know surrounding regions so that proves what that proves somewhere those islands were you know the there was a common place from where they have radiated out and now we know it perfectly that these all land masses were one land mass club together that was called as pangea and because of continental drift this has got you know separated these masses have got separated and they are still moving okay anyway so there are five uh, six bio biogeographical realms one by one we'll talk about all that is knee arctic so knee arctic you can see it's north america and surrounding regions neotropical you can see south america and the, some other islands which are associated with that here you can say ethiopian ethiopian you can see the african part major major part of africa is there in ethiopian area okay Eth ethiopian realm here you can see pali arctic pali arctic will have those european european russian all these region and here you can see some oriental region oriental region will have the india and all those you know surrounding islands and there's a separate realm called as australian so australian will be having the australia new guinea all these islands will come in the australian realm got it so this proves now for example if you talk about australia australia was much separated so here only you can see pouched mammals are strictly located in the australian islands or the nearby islands but you won't find those kangaroos in the other part of the world so that clearly proves that you know this the australia would have got separated very much earlier as compared to the other you know all those other continent got it so this is very important for the study of the evolution how the evolution would have taken place got it now next we'll talk about the theories of organic evolution let's talk about the theories of organic evolution let's talk about the lamarckism first so lamarckism says the theory of acquired inheritance now lamarck wrote a book also called as philosophic zoologic now this is the book which was written by lamarck that is philosophic zoologic in which he has explained about the theory of inheritance of acquired characters now what is the theory of inheritance of acquired characters let's see in detail now you see there are some factors which are working for example if i talk about internal vital forces now suppose you want to you know you you want to fly so for that there should be some internal desire in you some internal vital forces should work and combining these factors now you see internal vital forces effect of environment should also be there so there is a need or desire that means you are desiring something to happen so this combined with internal vital forces and along with use and disuse of organs so these three proponents were given by lamarck and if we combine these three prop propositions we find that this can lead to new characters that is acquired characters can come these acquired characters when they accumulate over time they can form a new a species you can see here they can form a new species if they acquire over time that means if they are inherited they will be definitely leading to a new species that was the you know concept given by lamarck and if you apply some genetic rules in some areas you find that this is okay this works also 
yeah but we won't say that you know desire or something but still there are some genetic principles if we apply then it is possible okay so we can't 100% neglect this theory also so let's talk about the examples what he gave he gave an example of long neck and the four limbs of giraffe so the neck of the giraffe got extended because they had to now you know go for you know feeding on some higher you know plants so the plants which were in much taller they had to feed on that so that was a problem because of this the elongation of the neck took place and the four limbs also elongated so four limbs and neck got elongated in giraffe that was explained by lamarck now even lamarck was not 100% correct that is we know it so there was a scientist called wiesmann who you know was against the theory he criticized lamarck's theory and he gave experimental proof also for that so what he did he just started cutting the tail of the mice so when you cut the tail of the mice when he cut the tail of mice for first generation then again he made them to mate and again second generation you can see the tail is not here here so tail was cut in the after first generation you can see tail was cut then second generation also he cut the tail so the second generation also they had the tail after they are mating they are still having the tail so when the tail was cut in the first generation the first generation had bred is still the second generation also had the tail now so in that case if you see around continuous he did for what around 22 generations he started doing this he cut the tail and again they made them to mate and he found that up to 22 generation he did this process still is still the organism is still the young one which was produced had tail again so that was something you know very strong contradiction to the theory of lamarck so wies mens criticism is appreciable here now but if you see this is also a kind of criticism against lamarck's theory and indian women you know they have been piercing the nose and the ears for such a long time but still there is no one who has been born with a ready made you know uh, pierced nose or ear so that proves that the criticism which was given against lamarck is hence proved in this case but still in some cases lamarck is you know uh, lamarck is much more uh, sure about his uh, theories for example if you talk about the loss loss of limbs in snakes and even a, a blind uh, salamander or the cave salamander there also his propositions are uh, proving to be right so maybe he is not 100% wrong anyway anyway so let's talk about the next theory of organic evolution that is darwinism now darwin was such a genius and he explained you know natural selection process so he gave a theory of natural selection and he wrote a book called origin of a species by means of natural selection so this was a book he wrote and this was a theory he gave and he traveled on a ship called hms beagle during his voyage and he kept researching and you know finding new uh, theo theories he, he started uh, you know observing nature and collected so many specimens also from that so let's talk about darwin what he did what are darwin's theory in detail so darwin was influenced by two major you know uh, authorities there one was thomas malthus and next was charles lyell even he was also influenced by one of his you know uh, counterpart who also was working on the same kind of uh, you know theory that is alfred russell wallace so there these three one influenced him very well thomas malthus who wrote a book called principles of population he wrote an essay on principles of population and charles lyell wrote a book called principles of geology so we'll be talking about in detail now alfred russell wallace was working on uh, uh, this uh, present indonesia which was which you can call as malay archipelago now presently it is in indonesia so two key concepts which darwin gave were the natural selection 
and other was the descent with modification okay that is branching descent and next was a natural selection got it so we'll talk about all these things in detail now let's start theory of natural selection as given by darwin had some postulates first is overpopulation so there is always a check on the overpopulation by nature and that is the struggle for existence will always be there so overproduction which leads to overpopulation and next is the struggle for existence variations and heredity next was a natural selection or the survival of fittest these were the postulates by darwin and the fifth postulate was these will lead to origin of new species so the sequence you remember overpopulation then there will be a struggle for existence then the ones who are fit they will be more they will be able to survive better and they will be one who will be producing the more progeny and that may lead to a new species so we'll talk one by one in detail so let's talk about the overproduction now you know the organisms do multiply in geometric ratios for example if you see the geometric ratio to 1 2 4 8 16 this is the population growth but the food is growing in arithmetic progression so what will happen there will be always a check on the population you can see here so population size always you know ba balanced or kept on check because of the limited resources or the food so limited food or resources are there which keep a check on the population otherwise this earth would have been a hell like place okay so now except for some seasonal fluctuations you find a proper check on the population size okay for example in some cases like in rainy season or something you find the insects growing like anything that time there is a seasonal fluctuation that is an exception but usually the nature keeps a check on the population size so let's discuss about the struggle for existence now a struggle for existence can be of three types it can be intra specific between the same species members or it can be inter specific between the one species prey and predator relation and it can be with the environment also so that is environmental struggle for example flood drought can cause death so these all keep a check on the population next comes the fitness how the fitness will be there if the variations or the heredity operates he didn't have much knowledge about genetics but at least he talked about some variations so there are two kinds of variation one is beneficial one is harmful so he talked about these variations can be of two types one is useful variation other is what harmful variation so he meant that more of the useful variations will be leading to the new species so let's talk about in detail natural selection which he talked about that those those who are fit those who have a better variations those who had the useful variations or the adaptive variations are going to survive now so let's see more adaptive variations will be much more fit in those situations they will have the ability to adapt and produce more of the progeny so once they are producing more of the progeny that means they are reproductively more fit and according to darwin the reproductive fitness meant more of the progeny okay and the one who is more successful will produce more progeny he meant by the reproductive fitness okay let's see one point very important fitness is the end result of the ability to adapt and get selected by the nature so fitness is not only production of the you know uh, progeny it is the one which is the end result of the ability to adapt if you can adapt well to the situations then you are more fit and you are going to be selected by the nature what was meant is here that is what is meant by fitness but according to darwin fitness only means reproductive fitness now let's talk about the next one that is how the origin of new species will occur so let's see so those good variations which we called good variations are going to leave more of the progeny so the more progeny will be because of what those good variations which are there 
सो दोज गुड वेरिएशन विल प्रोड्यूस वॉट मोर नंबर ऑफ प्रोजेनिज सो आफ्टर नंबर ऑफ जनरेशन ईच ऑफ दम में फॉर्म अ न्यू स्पीशी बट इट वॉज नॉट हंड्रेड परसेंट करेक्ट बिकॉज इफ ऑल आर गोइंग टू बी गुड सो ओनली गुड वेरिएशन शुड बी ऑलवेज देयर वाय द यू नो हार्मफुल वेरिएशन आर देयर एनी वे वील नॉट टॉक अबाउट द क्रिटिसिज नाउ सो दिस वॉज द कॉन्सेप्ट गिवेन बाय डार्विन गॉर इट लेट्स कॉन्टिन्यू फॉर द नाउ ना डार्विन ऑल्सो टॉक अबाउट समथिंग अबाउट पेन जेनेसिस he tried to explain something but he was not successful in that so genetics was not his cup of tea anyway so theory of pan genesis he says that all organs of produce body produce some minuscules and those are called as minute particles or pan genes and these pan genes travel via blood stream and to the gametes and they are transferred they are transferred into the progeny and each organ will be having some kind of you know pan genes which are going to be mixed so blending nature is not present in genes as we know so this was proved by mandel but according to darwin there were some pan genes which are going to travel from each and every organ some pan genes are going to produce and they are going to travel via the blood stream and reach the gametes and those gametes are going to uh, during the zygote formation each organ which which has given those pan genes will be transferred in those particular respective organs which was not very convincing at least but still he tried his best to explain this now so comparison if we do about the lamarckism and darwinism if you take a example of giraffe only so take a example of giraffe and let's see what lamarck told lamarck told that you know because of the stretching of the neck as the food was scarce now the food was in the higher strata and the stretching of the neck led to the you know elongation of the limb and the uh, four limbs and the neck of the giraffe but as darwin if we take so darwin was more stressing on natural selection he was the one who told that you know they were always in a group in a members there were some individuals which already had those long neck but they the ones who didn't had long neck they died they ultimately died and the one which had the long neck they were going to survive they were going to produce more progeny so let's see those are the ones who are going to survive and the ones who didn't had those characters in future they are going to get extinct this was the comparison between the lamarck and the darwin's theory hope you understood this let's continue further with mutation theory now so mutation theory was given by hugo de ries he was working on a plant called enothera lamarckiana which is commonly called as evening primrose what are mutations according to hugo de ries mutations are large differences arising suddenly in a population so that's called as saltation so this is called saltation that means they are going to come suddenly they are inheritable and they are random and they are most important is non directional but if we compare darwin's variations they were directional but here it is directionless correct now mutations are actually mostly they are what recessive and mostly they are harmful saltation as we talked about this is a single step large mutation this was a term given by hugo de ries mutations are ultimate source of variation here we can not be very sure because most of the books are saying this for at your level but it's still mutations if they are ultimate source of variation if we say then how is it possible because if mutations are ultimate source of variation that means we should always have positive things we should not never have some harmful variations okay it is not possible because most of the Uh, you know mutations are recessive so how if they are recessive and harmful <coughs> so then how they can be the source of ultimate variations if they are usually harmful and recessive so this was criticized natural mutations are most not not very common actually and moreover if they are all if they are mostly recessive how they are going to be the one who is going to dominate in the evolutionary process so this was 
a major criticism against mutation theory so let's continue further and let's see the seval right effect that is called genetic drift very important concept so genetic drift always and always operates on a small population a very small isolated population this effect is going to operate moreover what is going to happen in this there is going to be a random change in the gene or the allelic frequencies in a population and it is always by a chance so let's see what we are going to study in this there are two forms of genetic drift one is the founders effect and other is your bottleneck effect so founders effect and bottleneck effect will study in detail so let's see what is founders effect now suppose genetic drift as we talked about so it is by sudden chance for example flood comes tsunami comes so most of the generation is wiped out from there most of the species allele alleles are wiped out from that for example andaman nicobar island in tsunami that would have been possible that almost all of the you know uh, person living there would have been wiped out but somehow luckily that didn't happen anyway so in the founders effect suppose it happens and most of the species most of the members are lost few members are left somehow they swim or uh, somewhere they, they by the they are carried away by the current and they reach some place where they where there's no uh, no one living uh, it's a, it's a isolated uh, you know island and they start you know uh, they they start breeding and they they keep on uh, you know increasing their families so what can happen is that can lead to a founders effect for example those darwin finches few in numbers they went to galapagos island and in future generations they multiplied like anything and they you know uh, means uh, there, there were so many islands and they diverged to so many islands and they are different different type of species formed from that group only so this is a perfect example of founders effect darwin's finches let's see how so this one species you see one of the member of this population a has drifted you know they have gone they somehow they have drifted from the main population now what is happening you see the one who has migrated is a founder member now this can lead to what now the new members which have been added in that they are going to form a new population in future it may have you know possibility of forming a new species so this is the one called as founders effect okay so founders effect is when the original drifted population becomes the founder population and the new species develops from that so that will be called as the founders effect so let's talk about much more now a small group you know colonizes a new habitat new habitat is colonized by a very small group like in case of darwin's finches here you see bottleneck effect now in bottleneck effect there is a uh, very strange phenomena in which very few alleles are left because of those natural calamities as i told you maybe it may be flood it may be tsunami it may be earthquake whatever it is or maybe epidemic also like covid so let's see this is a parent population now you see in parent population you have red color you have blue color you have the yellow color also so you have yellow alleles blue and red beads which are representing the alleles here okay now this is something you know what happened is the bottleneck effect happened now very few alleles were left you can see very few alleles are left now so there were so many alleles in a population now few members are left and they are leading to what they are a kind of bottleneck effect now here is going to operate so when very few alleles are left it may happen that they may be completely lost they may not survive or they may lead to a bot the founders effect so this is a kind of situation called as bottleneck effect surviving individuals by chance which are left may lead to the next generations but you see in the next generation still there is no red bead in that that means allelic combination is still less now okay so it may be much more vulnerable to much more problems like teeta example can be given of bottleneck effect now there there the genetic variation is less in that so that may 
not survive in future they may become extinct still because there is no much more variation possible in that if if some disease happens to them so that may be possible that they may not survive so this is very important concept now we'll be talking about hardy wimberg principle now hardy wimberg principle this is a very important concept it it says there are two frequencies here you can see given that is p and q here so what is said the gene or the allelic frequencies in a large randomly mating population you see it's a randomly mating population are always stable are always stable means their unity and remain constant from generation to generation until some factors work so this is going to be constant from generation to generation if they are randomly mating if those different condition doesn't operate if gene migration doesn't happen okay so gene flow does not happen too much that then only it can be in stable conditions otherwise not genetic drift should not operate so anyway we'll talk about it p and q what is the p p is a frequency of the dominant allele and q is the frequency of the recessive allele for example capital a is the dominant allele so frequency is p and small a that is recessive allele frequency is q here okay so these are what these are the alleles and these are the frequencies of them okay let's continue further and let's see q is the frequency of recessive allele and you can see there's a you have applied the binomial theorem and you get got p square plus 2 pq plus q square so this is what p square will be the frequency of individual say genotype capital a capital a. that means homozygous dominant 2 pq will be the frequency of individual say genotype that is capital a small a that means heterozygotes and q square will be the frequency of individuals with genotype a small a small a that means recessive got it now let's continue further and let's see now which are the factors which are going to operate and will affect hardy wimberg equilibrium so let us talk one by one so first factor you saw is the genetic recombination or the crossing over next is your genetic drift so recombination genetic drift gene migration or gene flow next is the mutation and natural selection these factors if they do operate then the hardy wimberg principle will not be maintained in equilibrium and the evolution will happen so evolution is not happening because when these factors are not operating so these are going to affect this equilibrium that means it will cause evolution okay got it my point so random mating will not affect hardy wimberg equilibrium okay but selective mating will affect it hope you understood my point selective mating will affect but random mating will not affect so you can write it also if you want now next very a good example of natural selection will give so natural selection example the best example is industrial melanism in industrial melanism you saw this was given by bernard cattlewell and there was a peppered moth there were two species uh, there were the two variants one was the white winged other was a dark winged so white winged was a non melanic form and the dark one was a melanic form okay beston betularia was the moth now you can see before industrialization the one which was uh, light in color which was not easily preyed because the light was you know the background color was of the bark was little bit light because of the lichens but after industrial revolution what happened the background color you know became dark the lichens they were the soot deposited and the lichens also you know most of them uh, absorbed those soot and they died so that was a dark color now you can see so dark color now if the background is dark now the dark is saved it is camouflaged so here the number of dark ones increased but the one which was easily seen because the background was dark now so they were the the light color ones so they were easily preyed so this is an example what happened after industrial revolution so after industrial revolution the number of dark winged moth increased 
सो दिस इज एन परफेक्ट एग्जाम्पल हाउ द नेचर नेचुरल सेलेक्शन ऑपरेट दिस इज हाउ द नेचुरल सेलेक्शन विल ऑपरेट ओके लेट्स कंटिन्यू फॉर द नाउ नाउ मोर एग्जाम्पल्स वी कैन गिव लाइक पेस्टिसाइड रेजिस्टेंस इन इंसेक्ट्स और वी कैन ऑल्सो गिव ड्रग रेजिस्टेंस इन बैक्टीरिया एग्जाम्पल सो ड्रग रेजिस्टेंस इन बैक्टीरिया एज यू नो इफ यू टेक द एंटीबायोटिक्स वॉट कैन हैपन द बैक्टीरिया कैन सम बैक्टीरिया आर देयर इन दैट विच हैव रेजिस्टेंट टू दैट ड्रग्स सो दे कैन बिकम वॉट रेजिस्टेंट सो बैक्टीरियल पॉपुलेशन यू सी those who are resistant those who are resistant now so this is the one who is resistant to the drugs taken so what will happen now others have died but still there was some some who was resistant to the drug you took to the antibiotic you took so what will happen their numbers will now increase so antibiotics have killed almost 99% but still 1% or 0.1% also is left so now they are going to what they have the chance of multiplying that means founders effect so now they can lead to what they can lead to a new population which will be bacterial resistant antibiotic resistance so these bacteria are going to be resistant to those antibiotics and that can be a bigger problem and which is going to be a big threat for the future generation let's continue further let you saw antibiotic resistance bacterium now multiplies and forms a new population which you can't treat with these normal antibiotics okay so let's continue further now in the same case ddt was spread so ddt resistance mosquitoes are present now so you you have they are they are more immune to this ddt still they they are not affected by it now evolution is not a directed process in the sense of determinism you can't determine in which direction it is going to happen it is always a stochastic event so evolution will be a stochastic process that means it is taking place by chance so chance event may take place in nature like floods earthquake all these things are what chance events even mutations are also what chance mutation can happen in organisms that is why we say that evolution is not a directed process in the sense of determinism you can't determine in which direction the evolution will take place got it even the covid also would have explained everything you never expected to stay at home for those many years anyway so let's continue further now talk about the genetic basis of the adaptations or the natural selection so let's talk about the genetic basis you see the rate of appearance of new forms is always linked to the life cycle or the life span now you can't imagine more mutations to happen in elephant as compared to bacteria so bacteria has a very less life span so they will have much more rate of appearance of new forms so once you have much more rate of appearance of new forms that means you have more of mutations possibility of having more mutations is there in them so less life span means there will be more the, there will be the ones who will have more mutations the rate of appearance of new forms will be more in that in which life form is less so rate of appearance of new life forms is inversely proportional to the life span got it now let's see how now you see experiment in this experiment there is a complete medium now in this complete medium you see the built in variations are present whatever the blue color is also there green color is also there that means that's complete medium both are living happily but now what happens this is a colony a of bacteria does normal growth okay now what happens some change in the feed component happens and only the blue color survives that is b so a was happily living here b was also living but a was suppose having normal growth b was also living but now when the change in the feed component took place so now at this time the b has survived a vanished so what you will say fitness of a is better or fitness of b is better now you tell me fitness of a will be better or fitness of b who is more fit so you can see 
Now, when the B only survives, it proves that fitness of B is better than fitness of A. It can survive in both conditions. Got it, my point? We can explain you much more by Liderbug's experiment. So let's discuss about the Liderbug's and Liderbug's experiment. Now, Liderbug's they took, you know, some bacteria in agar agar medium. Afterwards, they they cultured it in a master plate, and this was transferred to other plate by a velvet. Okay, this the velvet was put there and transferred to some penicillin medium. Let's see. Now this is going to be transferred now. Replica plate has been taken. So this has been transferred and replica plate first they made. So this replica plate, two conditions were there in which they kept only agar agar and in one case they kept agar in that agar agar they took penicillin also which is the antibiotic. So what happened now? The ones who were able to survive in the agar agar, they were all A, B, C, D, E, all survived here. You see, here all were there. Replica was made, and then this all have survived. But when there's a penicillin medium here, so those who were penicillin resistant, they were the one who will survive because they were having penicillin resistance. The but one which were having sensitivity towards the penicillin this vanished they were not able to survive so they the ones who are surviving they are only ones who are resistant to that so what do you understand by this did it happen that when this you know culture was done at that at that time only the a c e got resistant was it at the at that time only or earlier they were present in the population so this is what was proved by Liderbug's replica experiment that mutations are pre-adaptive. They were already present. The only thing is when the conditions came, when the penicillin was put, so those who were not having resistance to penicillin, they vanished and the ones which had resistance to penicillin, they survived. So this was a very important concept given by Liderbug's experiment that Never it happens that suddenly something comes, mutation comes. It is something which was already present in the population. It is only selected. So that is why we say natural selection. So this Liderbug's replica experiment proves or supports natural selection. Got it now? Let's continue further now. Now you see, we talked about natural selection, but it's still artificial selection also operates due to human interference humans have been continuously breeding those plants and you know animals also and that has led to different types of you know species coming out so let's see so artificial selection is almost similar to natural selection except that the role of nature is taken by man and the characters are for his own purpose or on own use on benefit examples you can see in plants different varieties of wheat rice sugarcane cotton pulses you can see here this is also a plant example there was a wild variety of you know brassica olireca and from that broccoli cauliflower cabbage brussels sprout kohlrabi kale all these have come from the brassica olirecia so this is something which proves that humans have interfered in the wild variety and produce something for their own benefit that is for their own commercial benefit in animals also they have been doing you know different breeds of horses dogs pigeons poultry have been produced by humans okay because of some commercial interest or maybe for some other purposes also we don't know but that has been done by humans continuously and that is called as artificial selection. So anything which is happening by human interference will be artificial selection. Now, very important concept. What are the types of natural selection? We studied natural selection, but now we'll be studying about the types of natural selection. So there are basically three types of natural selection. One is your stabilizing selection. So in a stabilizing selection, 
there's always and always the phenotypic which is favored is the intermediate one so you can see this is very light color this is dark color so one which is going to be favored is the intermediate color so when you are favoring the intermediates not the peripheral values that is called as stabilizing selection or the mean value which we say is being favored here you can see here before selection what happened only the intermediate are going to survive so mean value is going to survive here not the int extremes got it so e example is given average body weight of newborn babies in humans the babies which are born very less in weight they don't survive and which are born very heavily they also don't survive so one who survives this average weight of the babies is much more favorable okay so let's talk about the next type of selection that is called as directional selection in the directional selection which is example as you know industrial melanism only one was favored either the dark or the light so here one extreme will be favored either the dark or the light here so only when only one extreme is favored not the intermediate value that is called as directional selection in this case so let's see example example is industrial melanism or the one which was resistance like ddt resistance malaria you know parasite that was the uh, insects the malaria in the mosquitoes the mosquitoes which were resistant to the ddt they survived more as compared to the normal ones so that means you are favoring you are favoring one only so when you one is favored that is directional selection here also one is favored that is directional selection only one is favored okay the more of the darker area darker ones let's talk about the third type of selection that is called as disruptive selection in the disruptive selection only extremes are favored not the intermediate for example the dark and the light will be favored not the intermediate ones it is not the one extreme it is both extremes which are favored here let's see an example also in this case you see before selection what happened and after selection light is favored and dark is favored so this is disruptive selection examples can be given for the you know shell pattern in limpets in shell pattern in limpets if you talk about so the one which is very dark will be favored which is very light will be favored but the intermediate will not be favored let's see how so white shelled limpets camouflage with colony of white barnacle and dark shelled limpets camouflage with the rocks which are very dark colored so both of them are being saved they are not able they are not being located by the birds easily but the one which is intermediate color they are easily seen and they are killed by the predators so here what happened only the extremes were favored only the extremes are favored so this is called disruptive selection in disruptive selection extremes will be favored hope you understood this very well now we come to a brief account of evolution as you know the plants came first on the land and then came the animals so let us discuss all these concepts here so first cellular form of life came around 2 billion years ago and first eukaryotic cells appeared 1.5 billion years ago rna like substance rna like mo molecules were present around 3 billion years ago when did the invertebrates came invertebrates came around 500 million years ago what about the jawless fishes that is the first vertebrates they came around 350 million years ago what about the sea weeds sea weeds came around 320 million years ago so this is all very important because it's given in ncert and you must remember the first organism that came on land were the plants then came the animals first mammals were shrew like they were primates which were first primates were like shrew okay and you see the giant ferns were present but they all fell and gave rise to the coal deposits slowly and slowly they all fell down 
and gave rise to the coal deposits so please remember all these points are very very important so what is the age of earth if we talk about when did the first life came on earth first life came on earth 4 billion years ago what is the age of earth that is 4.5 billion years ago so after 500 million years of formation of earth the first life appeared please make it a point write down those these points which are also given in ncert also please note it down so let's talk about the family history of dinosaurs and their modern counterparts so the question can also come from this you know chart also so let's see what they want to tell you in ncert see triceratops you can see here triceratops is herbivore here one thing you should know it is herbivore here the stegosaurus is also herbivore even the brachiosaurus is also what herbivore so very important to understand what they want to explain you and how this evolution has took place archaeopteryx archaeopteryx has toothed beak it had tooth in the beak but pteranodon it has toothless beak so this was a evolution how it was progressing now you can see here so pteranodon has evolved in this lineage only but it had toothless beak pteranosaurus this is the t rex which you call the fearsome dinosaur and this was the biggest dinosaur on land so please write down biggest dinosaur on land is t rex and this became extinct around 65 million years ago this was very important in terms of ncert has asked one question also in neat also one question came so which is the biggest dinosaur i think in neat or maybe in karnataka ct it this question came so that was the question that biggest dinosaur is so it is tyrannosaurus tyrannosaurus is the biggest one let's come and discuss about the geological time scale now geological time scale is very easy you have to just you know remember few things that's it for example if i talk about the cambrian so cambrian is characterized by trilobites so trilobites were dominant here silurian silurian the first fish has evolved ordovician the first jawless fish has evolved here it is little bit to correction you have to make jawless fishes so jawless fishes are not proper fishes they are uh, vertebrates so first vertebrates evolved in the ordovician silurian first fishes evolved devonian devonian is characterized by age of fishes so age of fishes is devonian silurian the fishes appeared so true fishes evolved in silurian please write down these important points okay now amphibians evolved in so amphibians evolved in devonian but they became dominant so age of amphibians is so age of amphibians is the carboniferous so these are important points which you can remember now so when did the first amphibians arose this was devonian when they became dominant was carboniferous in permian rept mam mam mammal like reptiles were present now and from this time only the mammal like reptiles were present in triassic the evolution of mammals started with jurassic the first birds that is toothed birds appeared in cretaceous first modern birds appeared first flowering plant also came in the cretaceous it was little bit developed in jurassic and then it came in the cretaceous they developed very well now how to remember all these things here you see this is very easy so these are the era here so you can see paleozoic era mesozoic era and this is cenozoic era afterwards there are some periods so you can remember periods here cos dcp cos dcp is what c for cambrian o for ordovician s for silurian d for devonian c for carboniferous and p for permian so this is cos dcp 
Then it is TJC, TJC. That is Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Afterwards, you have something Paleocene, Eocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Listocene, and recent. Recent is also called as Holocene. This is also called as Holocene. So how to remember this? Put eggs on my plate, please, Richard. Put put eggs on my plate. So you can write here. Put eggs on my plate please hurry or please richard anything you can write here so this is how you can remember by a mnemonic okay so it is paleocene eocene oligocene miocene pliocene and leistocene so in leistocene you see early man like you know the hominids came for it clear so once you have to read all these things that is more than enough for it. Main, main points I have told you. That is only what will be asked. Okay. So let's continue further. Now this is also a very important chart in NCRT. So you have to just remember a few things. For example, the mammals originated from synapsids or sauropsids. So you have to remember it is synapsids. The reptilian origin was from sauropsids. Even the reptilian origin and even the birds origin from the Sauropsids. So birds and you know dinosaurs and the crocodiles, they all have evolved from thecodonts. Please remember the thecodonts have given rise to the crocodiles, then there are the dinosaurs, and from there the branch is coming out that's birds. So birds, dinosaurs, and the crocodiles all have the origin from thecodonts. So please remember, thecodonts have given rise to what? Thecodonts have given rise to the birds and the crocodiles and the, that is your dinosaurs. Okay, now here you remember, the rapsids. So the rapsids gave rise to what? Gave rise to the mammals. So mammals took origin from the, the rapsids. You can see here, the rapsids. So the rapsids were present in which? You know, period, you can see Triassic period. So in Triassic period, the evolution of mammal started from the therapsids. For it, and these therapsids evolved from pelicae source. Pelicae source gave rise to therapsid, therapsids gave rise to mammals. Is it clear with you? This is very important. Okay. So you have to just few things you have to remember. Okay, not more. Uh, there's nothing more to remember in this. Few points you have to remember. When when the dinosaurs got extinct, did they ask you? Then you can see around, you know, 65 million years ago here. So 65 million years ago, they are getting extinct. Okay. So 65 million years ago, they are getting extinct here. Clear? So some few things you have to just observe in this and remember. That's it. Now let's talk about the reproductive isolation. Very important. So in reproductive isolation, it can be pre-zygotic and post-zygotic. So who gave this, you know, who explained about this? He was Stibbins. Stibbins was a scientist in his book that is Process of Organic Evolution. He has maintained it. So why the reproductive isolation is there? Reproductive isolation is there to prevent what? Interbreeding between the populations of two different or closely related species. So two closely related species or different species. So to prevent inbreeding between those populations, there is always a reproductive isolation or a check. Okay. Now you see, this can be of two types. One is your pre-zygotic, other is your post-zygotic. Before the formation of zygote, it is what? Pre-zygotic. And after the formation of zygote, it may be the zygote is not able to develop further or it is going to be going for a hybrid breakdown that we'll see now. So after formation of zygote, it's post-zygotic. Before formation of zygote, it is pre-zygotic. Please remember this. So let's talk about the pre-zygotic isolation first. So pre-zygotic isolation means before the formation of zygote. So let's see. Ecological isolation. Now, there is a different, you know, habitat. For example, bird and fish, they can't interbreed because they have a different habitat. So that is called as ecological isolation. Then there's a temporal isolation. Now the breeding seasons can be different. So when the breeding seasons are different, they won't be going for a mating. 
that is temporal isolation okay different breeding seasons next comes the behavioral isolation now a peacock has to impress the peahen okay by dancing and all so the one who is not able to do that the female is not going to attract to that so that is a kind of what behavioral isolation due to difference in sexual behavior the mating behavior the mating patterns that can be different so they won't be considered as a mate next comes the mechanical isolation so in mechanical isolation the the genital organs they may not be compatible so genital organs are incompatible here and in case of the gametic isolation if the gametes have crossed those barriers also even then also the gametes will not be able to you know fuse properly because there is a fertilizing anti fertilizing reactions so there are species specific reactions going on in the mating of gametes in the fusion of gametes so that also is not possible so this is all a check but suppose some in some animals this check you know goes off this check is crossed now so that zygote will be formed in that case so if the zygote is formed then what happens then also there are some checks called as post zygotic isolation for example when the hybrid is formed the zygote is formed but the zygote hybrid zygote is not able to develop further that is hybrid inviability that condition is called as hybrid inviability that means zygote is formed still it is not going to further develop it will break down okay after some divisions it will fall off hybrid sterility now suppose the zygote also got implanted even the baby was born okay the complete gestation process went and the baby was born is still that baby or the progeny is going to be sterile in this case that's a example of mule so example is mule here so that's not going to be fertile it's sterile so hybrids are going to be sterile in that case let's talk about the next case that is your next case we'll talk about this is what this was a case of sterility that is hybrid sterility male donkey and female horse produces mule male horse and female donkey produces hinny both are what sterile so this is a case of what hybrid sterility got it next case you see in next case there is a hybrid breakdown now suppose the you know f1 generation is produced and those f1 generation progeny they also give rise to what a progeny a next pro generation progeny comes out but is still you know by back cross it is possible but is still those will lack the vigor and vitality so they will not be that much active and will not be able to produce further progenies because of the less of the vigor examples are given that is male lion and female tiger that is male lion lion is fertile even the female tiger is also fertile here they are crossed and fertile progeny is produced it is not sterile so here you can see f1 generation is okay still it is fertile it can produce progeny but the problem is they have reduced vigor or vitality so in future they may not have more of progenies and they will you know they can't go for further of you know survival the survival can be in danger here also you can see male tiger and female lion gives out tigon which is a fertile but still they will not be that having that vigor and vitality so this is a case of hybrid breakdown hybrid breakdown cases your tiger and tigon clear let's talk about now the speciation how the species are formed in speciation there are two types of species we'll talk about one is a divergent speciation other is transformational speciation in divergent speciation we'll talk about the two examples that is your allopatric and your sympatric okay and in transformational species you see species a is going to transform into a species b but here you see species a is diverging into what species b and species c so this is a case of what divergence and this is a case of what transformation it is just getting transformed into 
completely transform into B. So this is a transformational species, this is a divergent species. Examples of divergent are allopatric and the sympatric speciation. Whereas examples for the transformational speciation is the phyletic speciation. Phyletic speciation means gradual speciation. Got it? Like the evolution of horse. So evolution of horse here you can say is an example of what? Evolution of horse is an example of phyletic speciation. Even you have quantum speciation means jump when a you know new species is formed by some mutation. So it is a jump, sudden jump which takes place. It's quantum speciation. Okay, got it now. So let's talk about bit detail of allopatric and sympatric speciation. Allopatric means different fatherland. They will be formed by a geographical isolation. So you see here, this is the parental population here. All types of vegetation are same. But here what happens, because of geographical isolation, some earthquake comes or some land landslides come and now the barrier is there between them. So you can see now, in course of time, they are not able to breed now. So when they are not able to breed slowly and slowly, they may give rise to what? Different species. So this is a completely a case of what? Geographical isolation. So when the species are formed, new species are formed because of geographical isolation, it is called as allopatric speciation. Allo means different, patric means fatherland. So different fatherland means now they are separated by geographical isolation. But in case of sympatric speciation, on the same land, sympatric, same fatherland, so same land, now what happens, there is a mutation. For example, here you see, this is a parental population here. In the parental population, there is nothing, no mutation. But now in case of some, you know, some mutation takes place and the new ones are not able to breed with the previous members of the population. So what will happen is, they will give rise to a new population. So new population on the same land occurs because of their mutations which are preventing them to mate between themselves. So this is going to give rise to a new species. This kind of a species will be called as sympatric and here there is no, no geographical isolation. So without geographical isolation. Is it clear with you? Perfectly clear? So here it is geographical isolation is there is no geographical isolation. Here there are you know different uh, you know uh, species are being formed because of the geographical isolation. Here on the same land two species are formed. Clear? Let's continue further now. Let's talk about the evolution of uh, the types of evolution. Now different types of evolution can be there, like micro evolution. Okay, so micro evolution is what? When the evolution is taking place at a species level or a subspecies level. You can see here. And macro evolution takes place at the level of order, family, genus. Like marsupial evolution. And when the evolution takes place at the phylum, class or the you know, g kingdom at that level, at very high level, that's called mega evolution. Okay. So let's talk about the examples now. Formation of subspecies or the races takes place because of microevolution. Now example of macroevolution is Australian marsupials. So it is occurring at order, family or genus level. But if I talk about the evolution of fishes from amphibians, so what is happening is one different class is being produced. Fishes are being produced from what? From the amphibians. So that is a case of mega evolution. So on what level the evolution occurs? Accordingly, you are going to tell about the kind of evolution taking place. So if it is taking at the species level, micro. Order family genus, macro. Kingdom phylum class, mega. Clear to you? Most of the evolution you find first in the species level. That is most of the evolution takes place at the micro evolution first. Now let's talk about the evidence for common origin of human and ape. Now we'll talk about the human evolution. So apes and humans, they have the similar 
बैंडिंग पैटर्न इन क्रोमोजो नंबर थ्री एंड सिक्स इन क्रोमोजो नंबर थ्री एंड सिक्स सिमिलर बैंडिंग पैटर्न इज फाउंड सो दैट प्रूव द ह्यूमन एंड चिम्पैनजी क्रोमोजोम आई एम टॉक अबाउट सो इन ह्यूमन एंड चिम्पैनजी क्रोमोजोम द थर्ड क्रोमोजोम एंड सिक्स क्रोमोजोम हैव मच ऑफ सिमिलरिटी ऑलमोस्ट हंड्रेड परसेंट नाउ वन मोर थिंग इफ वी टॉक अबाउट द क्रोमोजोम नंबर क्रोमोजोम नंबर ऑफ चिम्पैनजी इज फोर्टी एट एंड ह्यूमन इज फोर्टी सिक्स सो नाउ इट इज वेरी क्लोज फोर्टी सिक्स एंड फोर्टी एट क्रोमोजोम नंबर दैट मीन्स वेरी क्लोज ओरिजिन समवेयर हैज टेकन प्लेस नेक्स्ट इज डी एन ए ऑफ ह्यूमन इज मोर देन नाइनटी 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 नाइन परसेंट सिमिलर विच चिम्पैनजी एंड इस कल ऑफ बेबी चिम्पैनजी रिजेंबल्स एडल्ट कल सो दैट इज वेरी मच मोर क्लियर कट एग्जाम्पल The skull of baby chimpanzee is more like adult human, so that proves that somewhere the origin was same. That is why the characters are similar earlier. Then they start diverging little bit. Now hemoglobin and the blood grouping, that is ABO blood group, is same in the humans and apes. Even the composition of hemoglobin is same in the apes and humans. So this proves a common ancestry of humans and apes is it okay with you so let's continue further and talk about much more details about the human evolution so let's talk about the human evolution now fossils of ancestors of man can be categorized into three categories one is ape man fossils other is ape fossils and third is your man fossils so let's talk about the ape fossils first so ape fossils are dryopithecus it is also called proconsul next is your ramapithecus then sivapithecus and caniapithecus these are all ape fossils please remember these are what ape fossils here ramapithecus dryopithecus and sivapithecus and caniapithecus ape man fossils so what are ape man fossils they are australopithecus australopithecus is ape like ape man fossils which are connecting between the apes and hominids next is your man fossils man fossils comes Like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. So these all will be called as man fossils because these are hominids. These are the hominids. That means very close to humans. They are human-like. Okay. So let's talk about the the Australopithecus and Dryopithecus first. So ape fossils we'll talk about about the Dryopithecus and Ramapithecus. These were existing about fifteen million years ago. About 15 million years ago, they existed, and they were usually living on trees. They used to come down for some time. So, Dryopithecus and Ramapithecus, they were quadrupedal. They were completely and completely herbivorous. So, they never ate meat here. Dryopithecus and Ramapithecus, they are the ancestors for both man also and ape also. Common ancestor of man and ape. Please write it down. they had semi erect posture but they were actually quadrupedal please remember quadrupedal but they had semi erect posture that means they can come down and walk for some time next they had body had thick hairs and they were completely vegetarian four limbs were longer than hind limbs that is the characteristic of apes so that is why they are common ancestor for man also and apes also who was more man like ramapithecus which is obtained from shivalik hills of india is more of man like and dryopithecus was more of ape like okay so ramapithecus was more man like while dryopithecus was ape like please remember this point next you see we'll talk about the ape man fossils in ape man fossils we talked about the australopithecus so australopithecus existed around 2 million years ago in the eastern african grasslands and here you can see there was discovered the fossil was discovered by professor raymond dart and his its name was wang baby or scientific name of wang baby is australopithecus africanus and they lived around 2 million years ago in east african grassland please remember it is africanus not afarensis if it is afarensis that is a different uh, lucy that is a female fossil which was found okay now these australopithecus they were not eating meat but they hunted 
with stone weapons so they hunted with stone weapons but essentially ate fruits only so they were not eating meat cranial capacity was less around 600 600 cc only okay osteopathic is the connecting link between the apes and man and this was the one to stand erect so the one to stand erect was australopithecus so first ancestor of man to have erect posture is australopithecus please remember very important point here next comes your man fossils or the prehistoric man homo habilis we will start with homo habilis that is homo habilis is also called as handy man or the tool maker next comes the homo erectus so first we'll talk about the homo habilis they also existed around 2 million years ago little bit more cranial capacity that is 650 to 800 cc was present jaws were prognathous that means they were projected in front okay food habit if you talk about they were probably not eating meat they did not eat meat probably did not eat meat the special features if we talk about they were the first human being like that means first hominids and they were the one to make tools so the first tool maker or the handy man is homo habilis whereas if we talk about the homo erectus they were the first to use fire first to use fire was homo erectus it was existing 1.5 million years ago average cranial capacity was 900 cc and again the jaws were prognathous they probably ate meat they were the one who probably would have eaten meat according to their dental pattern use of fire was the first time in case of homo erectus fossils have been found for java man peking man and heidelberg man so they all are come under the category of homo erectus different species but come under category of homo erectus so let's talk further about the homo sapiens now homo sapiens there are three species of them one is homo sapiens neanderthalis other is your homo sapiens fossilis and third one is your homo sapiens sapiens that is the modern man this is the cro magnon man and homo sapiens neanderthalis is your neanderthal man so let's talk about one by one neanderthal man so neanderthal man is the homo sapiens neanderthalis and the time period in which they existed was 1 lakh to 40000 years ago they were the first one to have the burial and they practice some religion cranial capacity was around equal to modern man that is 1400 cc jaws were prognathous but they were slightly going into the direction of orthognathous they were evolving as orthognathous now food habit they were completely omnivorous and they practice some religion so they lived in east and central asia and used a skin as for protection because at the time there was too much cold there was almost ice age going on in that area so ritual burial of dead this was the one which is very important they practice some religion and they buried their dead with proper ceremonials and the rituals next comes your cro magnon man that is homo sapiens fossilis homo sapiens fossilis cranial capacity was much more than humans it was 1650 cc they existed around 50000 to 1 10000 years ago and they were completely orthognathous now they were the first one to have cave paintings so they were living in caves and they were you know practicing the cave paintings and even they domesticated the animals also they also practice religion and even you can see 18000 years old cave arts are still present in bimbekta part of the madhya pradesh that is in raisen okay so there you can see some cave paintings done by them next comes your homo sapiens sapiens that is modern man the cranial capacity of modern man is equal to that of almost neanderthal man that is 1450 cc and they existed around 10000 years ago orthognathous completely omnivorous and started agriculture around 10000 years ago so this is the modern man they arose during the ice age 75000 to 10000 years ago this is a point of ncert so please remember this got it so this was about the homo sapiens sapiens got it modern man now comes some questions few questions which came in the previous years or in the past 2 3 years let us discuss those questions now 
सो लेट्स डिस्कस क्वेश्चन नंबर वन मैच द लिस्ट एंड चूज अ करेक्ट आंसर फ्रॉम द फॉलोइंग सो एडेप्टिव रेडिएशन एडेप्टिव रेडिएशन आई टोल्ड यू इट इज फाउंड इन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग डार्विन फिंचेस डार्विन फिंचेस विल शो यू एडेप्टिव रेडिएशन विच इज डायवर्जेंट इवोल्यूशन रिजल्टेड इन वॉट एडेप्टिव रेडिएशन एंड डार्विन फिंचेस आर परफेक्ट एग्जाम्पल ऑफ एडेप्टिव रेडिएशन सो ए इज फॉर फोर एंड इंटरेस्टिंगली इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन इफ यूर फर्स्ट यू नो ऑप्शन मैच मैचिंग इज करेक्ट योर आंसर वुड हैव बीन करेक्ट दैट वॉज हैपनिंग इन ईच एंड एवरी क्वेश्चन ऑफ मैचिंग इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन पेपर इन कन्वर्जेंट इवोल्यूशन कन्वर्जेंट इवोल्यूशन यू सी विंग्स ऑफ बटरफ्लाई एंड विंग्स ऑफ बर्ड्स सो दैट बी गोज फॉर थ्री डायवर्जेंट इवोल्यूशन इज फॉर द बोन्स ऑफ फोलिम्स इन मैन एंड वेल दैट इज होमोलॉजी एग्जिबिटिंग होमोलॉजी देयर इवोल्यूशन बाय एंथ्रोपोजेनिक एक्शन इज योर सेलेक्शन ऑफ रेजिस्टेंट वराइटीज डू टू एक्सेसिव यूज ऑफ हार्बी साइड एंड पेस्टिसाइड्स सो यू कैन इजिली मैच इट डाउन सो एडेप्टेड रेडिएशन गोज फॉर वॉट डार्विन फिंचेस दैट मीन्स ए गोज फॉर फोर सो ए गोज फॉर फोर यू सी इफ योर फर्स्ट मैचिंग इज करेक्ट इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन पेपर योर ऑल मैचिंग आर करेक्ट कन्वर्जेंट इवोल्यूशन आई टोल्ड यू दैट गोज फॉर वॉट विंग्स ऑफ बटरफ्लाई सो दैट कम्स थर्ड डायवर्जेंट इवोल्यूशन गोज फॉर बोन्स of four limbs and the evolution by anthropogenic selection is by selection of resistant varieties got it now let's see the second question from his experiments sl miller produced amino acids by mixing the following in a closed flask so how much temperature he took around 800 degrees celsius so 600 degrees celsius is crossed out what gases he took ammonia methane and water vapor okay water vapor ammonia मीथेन सो रिमेंबर वॉटर वेपर अमोनिया मीथेन एंड हाइड्रोजन सो हाइड्रोजन वॉज देयर बट मीथेन इज नॉट हेयर सो दिस इज ऑल्सो क्रॉस आउट थ्री आर क्रॉस आउट तो मीथेन अमोनिया वॉटर वेपर एंड हाइड्रोजन वाम गैस इज वट टेकन एंड दिस इज एट एट हंड्रेड डिग्री सेल्सियस सो दिस इज द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर यू और इट लेट्स कंटिन्यू फर्दर फ्लिपर्स ऑफ पैंगवेन एंड डॉल्फिन वी जस्ट डिस्कस दिस फ्लिपर्स ऑफ पैंगवेन and dolphin dolphin is a mammal penguin is a bird so these are example perfect example of convergent evolution okay they can't be because of industrial mechanism or natural selection or adaptive radiation because adaptive radiation is for homology but this shows what analogy got it so this will be for convergent evolution next question you see which of the following refers to correct examples of organisms which have evolved due to changes in environment brought about by anthropogenic action so anthropogenic action again he is asking the same thing so darwin finches of galapagos island is it because of the you know anthropogenic action no so this can't be because of anthropogenic action herbicide resistant weeds yes drug resistant bacteria yes man created breeds of domesticated animals like dogs that is also kind of anthropogenic action because it's a artificial selection so we can go for this also as what anthropogenic action but it's still better we could have gone for what you know b and c but there's nothing option called b and c so we'll go for what b c and d got it let's continue further a population of a species invades a new area which of the following condition will lead to adaptive radiation now which condition which condition is going to lead to adaptive radiation so let's see now area with many habitats occupied by a large number of species no already they have large number of species areas so this can't be the option area with large number of habitats having low food supply low food supply also will not be able to sustain the population there area with a single type of vacant habitat no so the only option left will be area with many types of vacant habitats so many areas are there now many types of vacant habitats are there in that area so there's much more possibility of adaptive radiations happening there so that will be the perfect answer for this next question you see in australia marsupials and placental mammals have evolved to share many similarities Uh, so many similar characteristics this type of evolution may be referred to as so marsupials and placental mammals i told you what it shows 
it shows convergent evolution because on the same habitat what is happening two types of adaptive radiation have gone one is australian marsupials another is placental mammals so they exhibit convergent evolution between themselves got it let's continue with the next question now in a species the weight of newborn ranges from 2 to 5 kg 97% of newborn with an average weight between 3 to 3.3 kg survive whereas 99% of the infants born with weights from 2 to 2.5 kg or 4.5 to 5 kg die which type of selection process is taking place see when the extremes are not favored the mean value is favored it is called as stabilizing selection stabilizing selection should be the answer for this because extremes are not favored very less weight and very more too too much weight is not favored only the average weight is being favored here so it should be stabilizing selection got it now let's talk about the next question according to hugo de ries the mechanism of evolution is see hugo de ries talked about single step large mutation called as saltation so single step large mutation it is not multi step single step large mutation is saltation so it should be single step large mutation is your saltation so this should be the correct answer for this got it let's talk about the next one among the following sets of examples for divergent evolution select the incorrect match or the incorrect option so you see he is talking about divergent evolution and he is talking about the incorrect in that so four limbs of man bat and cheetah they are definitely homologous structures which will support divergent evolution heart of bat man and cheetah they are all vertebrates so heart of vertebrates also shows homology that means divergent evolution now eye of octopus and man and the bat so this can never be divergent evolution because they have different you know origin so different origin but same function may be there so that is not a divergent evolution so this will be a type of convergent evolution this is convergent evolution got it let's talk about the next question now a uh, population will not exist in hardy bimbug equilibrium it is not going to exist in hardy bimbug equilibrium if what condition should not make it to exist in hardy bimbug equilibrium so let's talk about so there are no mutations that means mutation were affecting it so this can't be the answer there is no migration so migration was affecting it still it is not happening population hardy bimbug always operates on what small population but the population is what large so that means in that case only the answer can be individuals mate selectively when they are mating selectively then it is affecting the hardy bimbug equilibrium so random mating i told you random mating does not affect does not affect hd wimberg equilibrium please remember so answer should be this one hope you understood this now keep practicing some questions and listen to the lecture again if you are not able to solve some question thank you thanks a lot